At this time, the ushers are going to be handing out a handout for you that's going to cover our lesson for today. For those that are visiting, we believe in the multiplication of disciples of Jesus Christ. And in order to do that, we have a study series that each one of our members memorizes. And they not only have these first principles on their hearts, but they're able to teach other people the first principles so they too will become disciples of Jesus. Secondly, we're just developing right now a follow-up study series. Because after people are baptized, a lot of times they feel like, oh man, where's all the attention? I, I was getting, it was awesome having all these Bible studies. And they feel a little bit let down and let go. Come on, and so we've developed a five-study follow-up series that will also be included in New First Principle booklets. As a matter of fact, today we're going to be going through what I call study follow-up number five. And it's on persecution. Now the uniqueness about this particular study is that it's a great study to use even before baptism, particularly with a lot of the students in the congregation who get a lot of persecution right off the bat, even while they're studying the Bible to become disciples of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to be asking the Bible talk leaders in the congregation here to be memorizing the whole study. But as with any study, we need to start with a word of prayer. Amen? Amen. As family, let's hold hands and let's go to our Father in heaven. Father God, we pray that you'll focus your attention down here. Father, we pray that your spirit will be poured freely and freshly upon us. That Heavenly Father, as we study these scriptures, everything will become clear. That, Father, we will get convictions from the Word of God that are going to change our life and the way we live our life, Heavenly Father, and the way that we stand up for Jesus. Be it this at this time. It's the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. As with all the studies... Except for light and darkness, these studies need to take place in about an hour or less. Otherwise, you lose the focus of the study and the impact it will have on those that you're studying with. We start off the study in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. The Bible says that's a fact. Anybody that wants to live a godly life, anybody that wants to be a disciple of Jesus Christ is going to be persecuted, and the Bible says that is a fact. Amen? And that's the premise to the whole study. Now, when you look at this study, you say, wow, there are two pages. This is so much. The study is very simple. It's very simple. The first point of the study is Jesus was persecuted. The second point was the first century church was persecuted. The third point is there are two reasons for persecution, life and doctrine. And the last point is very simply, oh, what do we do when we're persecuted? Well, now you have the whole study memorized. Jesus was persecuted. Amen. The first century church was persecuted. There are two reasons for persecution, life and doctrine. And the last point is simply, what are you going to do when you're persecuted? Because the Bible says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life, what? Will be persecuted. Amen. Let's start out. Jesus was persecuted by his family. Turn to Mark chapter 3. Beginning of verse 20. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. 
Now here is Jesus in the middle of his ministry. And his mom and his brothers think that he is out of his mind. This is pretty incredible. Because Mary gave birth to Jesus when she was a virgin. And yet he was so radical in his teaching and preaching that she says, man, he's out of his mind. Well, of course, we see what happens to many people who are disciples today. Many times, because of the radical changes we make, our family thinks, hey, you're brainwashed. You're under mind control. Well, you're in good company. Jesus' family thought he was out of his mind. Let's move on. Mark chapter 3. Verse 31. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him. He said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Well, right here, his family's so upset about what Jesus is doing that they send someone in to where he is teaching and said, hey, get Jesus to come outside and go home with us. And the person comes on in and says, hey, your mother and brothers are outside. And Jesus goes, well, who are my mothers and my brothers? And the Bible says right here, he looked at those that were seated in a circle around him that he was teaching. He says, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Notice he left out father. Why? Because he wanted everybody to know that God was his father. Amen, church? See, right here, Jesus prioritizes his spiritual family above his physical family. Wow. When a person has that conviction, it's going to make your physical family think, hey, you're out of your mind. You're crazy. You're brainwashed. Well, let's go to Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus has been crucified. He's resurrected from the dead. He spent 40 days with the apostles and he's just ascended back up into heaven to be with God. And we pick up the reading in verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. After Jesus had died and resurrected and ascended, his mom and his brothers were disciples. Why? Because Jesus did not compromise his priorities. His top priority was his relationship with God and the spiritual family of those people who obey the word of God, God's church. Amen? Amen? You know, I became a disciple. I became a Christian at the end of my freshman year at the University of Florida when I was 17 years old. And I was very fired up. But my parents lived in Chicago at that time, and I was really nervous about going home and telling them that I'd become a Christian. Well, when I told them, there really wasn't much of an impact right there. Neither one of my parents believed in Jesus, and because they, I guess, loved me, there really wasn't too much uh, negativity that came back at me. But of course, I also wanted my brother and my sister to become a Christian. Well, my brother Randy is about a year and a half younger than me, and I still remember going into his room the very first day and telling Randy I had become a Christian. I'd gotten baptized. Now, Randy was an existentialist. He was this long-haired hippie guy, you know. He thought he was cool. And... Uh, I started talking to him about the Bible. I started talking to him about a relationship with God. And he just goes, I'll never forget it. He starts getting really mad. He says, get out. Just get out. Get out of my room. Now, I probably made a young Christian mistake at this point. And I said, okay, I'm getting out. I'm not going to cast my pearls before swine. 
that was not a good move. I don't, I don't advise that. I'm just saying there was that level of persecution coming on back. Nine months later, Randy gets cancer, Hodgkin's disease. I'm by his side every day for a week, reading him the Bible, giving him cassette tapes. That's back, what, back then, I mean, cassettes. And, and his heart started turning. And I said, Randy, you're graduating. You need to come to the University of Florida. You got to be with me. You got to see this church I'm in. It's really awesome. Long story short, five months later, he comes down to the University of Florida as a freshman. We study the Bible every day for a week, and he's baptized into Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, my sister, my sister was 10 years younger than me, so she was, in, in a way, we weren't that close. But, you know, I wanted her always to become a Christian. And it was very hard growing up because we didn't spend a lot of time together. And so Dana just got further and further out there. And I would talk to her about being a Christian, but she wanted no part of it. It was sad. I saw her get married. It was sad. I saw her have a child. The marriage break up because of physical abuse. She went through a series of relationships. And then she eventually found her second husband. Well, when her life was really at the bottom, that's when my grandfather died and I did my grandpa's funeral. And after the funeral, Dana and I talked about her relationship with God and if she would die, where she would go. She started studying the Bible, and the following Sunday, she was baptized into Christ. I think one of the things that we need to get convinced about is that our families are not going to understand our commitment to God, particularly when our commitment to God and the church supersedes them. They're going to see that as rejection, and they're going to be upset. But we've got to understand, if we compromise... They lose their hope of salvation. So sometimes a person's family comes around fairly fast, like Randy. Other times, it may take 16 years. That's a long time for Dana. To become a disciple after I made my decision. But bottom line, Jesus was persecuted by his family. But because his priority was a spiritual family... At the end, his mom and all his brothers became disciples. That fire you on up right there. Well, what kind of persecution did Jesus suffer? Well, there was gossip and slander. Turn to John 7. We read in verse 12. Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said he's a good man. Others said, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the Jews. You know, look at verse 12 right here. It says, among the crowds, there was widespread whispering. That's gossip. They were gossiping about Jesus. Well, what were they saying? He deceives the people. He's a fake. He's a fraud. He's a charlatan. He's not for real. He's just faking them on. This was said about Jesus. Turn to John chapter 10. Verse 19. At these words, the Jews were again divided. Many of them said, he's demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? You know, almost every time Jesus preached, he divided the people. Amen? And a lot of times, Christians are accused of being divisive. Well, it's the message that divides people and their response to it. You know, right here we see that the persecution towards Jesus was one where there was name-calling. He's demon-possessed. And then there was character assassination. He's raving mad! And so, in this way, they were trying to get the people around him not to listen to him. I think it's very interesting that it was the Jews who were, for the most part, the biggest persecutors of Jesus. Now, the Jews in that day were, quote, God's people. And yet, when Jesus preached the word, he brought light into their lives and their doctrine and their thinking, 
And so these became the most intense in persecuting Jesus. Are you with me right here? The religious people are often the most intense persecutor of those who follow after Jesus. Turn to Luke chapter 23. We've got to look at the scope of persecution. For beginning in verse 1, Then the whole assembly, that's the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leadership, rose and led Jesus off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ the king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it's as you say, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priest in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He's starting Galilee and has come all the way here. Well, let's look at the charges against Jesus brought by the Jewish leadership. Number one, they said, this man is subverting our nation. Was Jesus subverting Israel? Absolutely not. Then they said he opposes the taxes to pay to in payment to Caesar. Well, we know the account of where Jesus tells Peter to go out and catch a fish, and there he'll find a coin in the fish's mouth, and he's to pay both Jesus' tax and Peter's tax. So this was a false charge. And then they said, Jesus claims to be Christ a king. Now that's a true charge, is it not? So what we see right here are these are the charges that were brought to Jesus. It was basically a bunch of half-truths. Now, what was the scope of his persecution? How far did it go? Well, these are the charges that led to capital punishment by death on the cross. Jesus was crucified because of half-truths. Well, look at the scope in the sense of territory right here. Look at, look at verse 5. When Pilate didn't want to accuse Jesus, they insist, the Jewish leadership, he stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. The argument that they're making is, Pilate, don't you see how many people are upset at Jesus? And of course, there's a phrase American Jews, where there's smoke, there's fire. And they're saying, look, all the way from Galilee, all the way down here to Jerusalem, look how many people are upset. I mean, good gravy. Where you see smoke, there's fire. Jesus has got some very serious problems. There's something wrong with him if this many people are upset. That's the reasoning right there. Are you with me right here, guys? See, we've got to understand that Jesus was never a popular preacher. He was never beloved by the majority. And yes, he stirred up trouble, not because he was preaching something wrong, but because he was preaching something right. In point three, I make this point. Jesus, who was perfect, was falsely accused, misunderstood by his family, and killed by religious leaders. What do you think will happen to you if you follow Jesus? Wow. So our first point is very simple. You've got it memorized already. Jesus was persecuted. Amen, guys? Well, let's go to our second one. The first century church was persecuted. Go to Acts chapter 5. Now, this is a pretty easy study, is it not? In Acts 5, the movement is forcefully advancing. And we read in verse 17 these words. Then the high priest and all his associates, who are members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. Wow! Now we're understanding why the religious leaders were upset. Jesus and the apostles were having a lot of people follow after them, and they were seeing their followership go down in numbers. They were jealous. Do you see that from the scriptures right here? Religious leaders are going to be upset with true Christians 
when their members are leaving their church, their congregations, and coming to a church that preaches the doctrine of the Word of God. Well, in the midst of this chapter, we find that the apostles are released by an angel. They go out and preach again, and they're rearrested. And then the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leadership, needs to decide what to do with them. Well, in the midst of this whole discussion, one of the most famous members, Gamaliel, gets up and says these words about the apostles in verse 38. Therefore, in this present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you'll not be able to stop these men. You'll only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. And the church said... I mean, right here, it's very clear that the Jewish leadership was ill-motivated. One of their motivations was jealousy. And they wanted to shut Christianity down. So they've arrested leaders. And Gamaliel says, hey, guys, you better just let these guys go. If, if this Christian thing is of men, it, it's going to die. But if it is of God, you're not going to be able to stop it. He says, if you try to, you're going to find yourself fighting God. You know, those people that persecute us, they may think they're even serving God like the Jewish leadership. But in fact, when they persecute true disciples, they're fighting God. Now, very interestingly, they compromised a bit. And they decide to let the apostles go, but not without a good flogging. And then they said, do not speak any further about this Jesus. Now remember, the Sanhedrin was, if you will, the intelligentsia of that day. They were the smartest guys in all of Israel. And you know something? They figured out how to stop Christianity. Notice, they didn't tell the apostles, stop believing what you believe. They just said, stop talking about it. See, a lot of times we think we're okay because we hold certain convictions. Uh Uh-uh. You got to stand up for Jesus and you got to let people know what your convictions are. Are you with me right here, guys? And the Bible says, after they were flogged, they were fired up that they were being persecuted just like Jesus. And it says, they never stopped. Preaching the word from house to house every day. Does that fire you on up, church? Turn to Acts chapter 28. Paul's been arrested. He's being taken to Rome. And several Jews come to meet him while he's in prison. Basically under house arrest. And we read in verse 21... The Jews replied, We have not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of the brothers who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. Wow. The church in the first century was highly controversial. How controversial? People everywhere, throughout the whole known world, was talking about this sect, or as we would call it, a cult called Christianity. You know, a lot of times when people call us a cult, we just, you know, we we get all panicked and shrivel on back. Hey, our first century brothers and sisters were called a sect. The same thing. Why? They preached the same message. Amen? Well, here's the bottom line. Since international Christian churches have the goal of imitating Jesus in the first century church, what will happen to us? Here's the next question. If a church is not being persecuted, what does that imply? A lot of times I'll study with people who call themselves Christians, 
And I really challenge them. Well, when was the last time you were persecuted? When was the last time your church was persecuted? See, we need to understand. If a person's not being persecuted, they are not a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says, in fact, everyone who desires to live a godly life will be persecuted. And if a church is not persecuted, you can be sure it's not God's church. The church of the first century embodied the entire spirit of Christ. As Christ was persecuted, so was his church. And we need to be proud of being persecuted for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So now you have the first two points. Jesus was persecuted. And the first century church was persecuted. You got that down yet? Okay, well now we just got to figure out what are the causes of persecution. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Beginning in verse 16. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. So the Bible says right here that every Christian needs to watch their life and watch their doctrine. Why? Because it's a matter of salvation, not only to us, but to everyone we speak to, to everyone we influence. So, what are the two fronts that persecution is going to occur on? Very simply, life and doctrine. Amen? Let's look at the life issue. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. Beginning in verse 3. The Spirit says in verse 3, for you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. You know, when you make a radical turn from the world, and you're not going to participate in these sins anymore, they're shocked and they begin to heap abuse. They start trashing you. You know, as I said before, I became a Christian as a freshman in college. But shortly after I was baptized, I went home for the summer. And then I came back to school and I lived at the Sigma Chi fraternity house. And one of my great costs was taking a stand for the Lord and sharing my faith. Well, the Lord really blessed me because in my first year as a disciple, I had seven fraternity brothers that were baptized into Christ. And uh, the last one, though, was very interesting. He was one of the pledges of the fraternity. And he'd asked me to be his big brother and to see him through the whole pledge situation. And I agreed to do that. And, and we also happened to have a chance to study the Bible. I mean, that's what you want for your little brother, right? And so he was baptized. Well, that just got everybody furious particularly the pledge trainer, a guy named Roger. And so he talks to all of the officers in the fraternity, and he says, this is absolutely uncalled for. We need to have a meeting with all the officers in the fraternity, and we need to bring Kip up about depinning him or kicking him out of the fraternity. Wow, when I heard that, <laughs> my heart sank. So the big meeting came. All the officers in the fraternity were there, and Roger, the pledge trainer, was there. And to really fully understand the story, you need to understand that back then, Bible talks were called soul talks, okay? And also, uh, one of the bars at the University of Florida in Gainesville was a place called Dubs. So, the whole thing's laid out. I mean, Roger just goes off. He says, I cannot believe it. Kip is out there talking to everybody about coming to soul talk. And then he tried to mock me. He goes, every dinner time, Kip's going out there, come to Soul Talk. Come to Soul Talk. Come to church. Well, I, at first, I was really afraid, but that ticked me off. 
Pastor Roger, you guys do the exact same thing. What you say is, come to Dubs. Come to the ABC Liquor Lounge. Come to the strip joints. And all the officer guys, they're laughing their heads off. And the president goes, oh, Roger, Kip got you there. We're done here. And that was, that was it. A couple weeks later, a couple weeks later, I was elected tribune in the fraternity. One of the top three offices. People may oppose you, but they respect a life that takes a stand. For the truth. But people are going to heap abuse on you. Look at verse 12. Chapter 4. Dear friends, do not be surprised. You know, a lot of Christians are surprised they got persecuted. (laughs) Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering as though something strange was happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any kind of criminal or even a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear his name. Now right here, he says two things. He says, don't be surprised that you're going to be persecuted. And don't be ashamed when you're persecuted. You know, a lot of us, so crave people's affection and attention that when they're upset with us, we go into the shame mode. We almost think we did something wrong and it shuts us down and we're filled with cowardice. And he says, do not be ashamed of your faith in Jesus Christ. But on the other hand, make sure when you're persecuted, you're being persecuted for righteousness. So if someone comes over to your apartment or dorm room or house and it's midnight and they knock on the door and say, hey, you guys are so noisy in here with your 50 people in this room. You are not being persecuted because of righteousness right there. You're in sin and you need to be respectful of your neighbors. Are you with me here, church? Let our persecution be because we're taking a stand for Jesus Christ. So... The causes of persecution are life and what? Okay, let's talk about the doctrine. Go to John 15. Beginning in verse 18. Jesus says, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world... It would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. All right here, it's it's very simple. Jesus says, hey, if they hated me, because you preached the exact same message, they're going to hate you. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. You got that? Amen, guys? Okay, now, drop down to verse 16. And we see further warnings by Jesus. Verse 1. All this I've told you so that you will not go astray. You know, a lot of times when people get persecuted and they're studying the Bible, they just quit for fear of the attacks of persecution and all the doubts and confusion That puts into people's mind. You know, we need to arm people with the understanding, hey, when you start living a godly life, you are going to be persecuted. Otherwise, they'll get fearful and they'll go astray. Amen, guys? Verse 19. Excuse me. Verse 2. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he's offering a service to God. They will do such things because they've not known the Father or me. I told you this so that when the time comes, you'll remember that I warned you. I didn't tell you this at first. Because I was with you. You know, right here, Jesus certainly began by warning them, hey, if I'm persecuted, you're persecuted. If I'm hated, you're going to be hated. He goes on, he says, hey, persecution can take you out. It can cause you to fall away. But then he says, he says, you need to be prepared because 
there's going to be a time when they put you out of the synagogue. This is very interesting. And he talks about how that not only will they put you out of the synagogue, but in the name of God, they will even kill you. Now, a lot of people fear being put out of the synagogue. Some people fear being ostracized by their religious friends. In the terms of one particular denomination, they're afraid of being excommunicated. In our case, with myself and all the members here, you've been disfellowshipped by people who claim they're doing this for God. And a lot of people that are joining the new movement, they're, they're all confused. What's going on? Well, the same thing's going on as with Jesus. When you take a stand for the truth, there are going to be some people who in the name of God cast you out of the synagogue, cast you out of the fellowship. He says, but don't worry about that. You just have your mind on doing the will of God. Are you with me here, church? Well, why? Why else do people hate us because of our doctrine? We'll turn to Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew 7, verse 13, Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Why do people hate us, persecute us? Well, it's our doctrine. We believe, because Jesus says it, that only a few on the narrow road are going to be saved. Why do they get upset? Because we teach from the Bible they're not on the narrow road. Go to Acts chapter 4. In Acts 4, Peter is speaking to the whole Jewish leadership, the Sanhedrin. And he says in verse 12, Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. He says, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're not going to be saved. That was all those guys on the Sanhedrin. That was bold, amen, guys? So what about the narrow road? How narrow is the road? Well, the Bible says right here that atheists, polytheists, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists will not go to heaven. That is the truth from God's word. You can only be saved through the name of Jesus Christ. But the road gets narrower. Turn to Acts 2, 36. Peter is preaching to thousands of people on the day of Pentecost there in Jerusalem. And he says in verse 36, Therefore let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus who we've crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and other brothers, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, right here, Peter preaches that Jesus Christ died for them. That, in fact, everybody's sins was what crucified Jesus. They come back and say, Man, we're cut to the heart. We believe that. Now what do we do? He says, Here's what you need to do. First of all, you need to repent. You need to turn from the darkness and turn to the light. You need to become a disciple. And then you need to be water baptized to have your sins forgiven and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, there are a lot of people in America today that say, so I believe in Jesus. But they haven't repented of their sins. Nor have they been baptized for the remission of sins received the gift of the Holy Spirit. So this condemns the faith-only crowd This condemns people who say, well, I was infant baptized. See, right here, you have to make your own decision. It's an adult decision to be baptized. And this condemns all people who say, I just said a prayer, and I just asked Jesus to come into my heart. Wow! The road got wicked narrow right there, didn't it? You know, it's very interesting. One of the the young ladies that's going to be baptized today Terry Stonebarger, had been, has been coming to church actually for quite some time. 
really loved the fellowship, really got in there with the brothers and sisters over there at Long Beach. And yet, sentimentality kind of kept her back because she was taught certain things in her old church. Well, finally, she decided, I've got to bring things to a head. I've got to make a decision. So she set up a meeting between her old pastor and Mike Patterson yesterday. And she says, teach me what the Bible says on how to be saved. Well, the old pastor laid out his thing. And then Mike brought out the Bible. After the discussion... She tells her old pastor, it's obvious what the Bible teaches. I'm going to be baptized and be a part of that church because they teach the truth. Amen, guys? But you know, it gets even narrower. Matthew chapter 28. If you're visiting, you go, wow, no wonder so many people hate you guys. Jesus says, before he ascends into heaven, he's speaking to 11 faithful disciples in verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. The Bible teaches right here that you not only have to have faith in Jesus, you not only have to repent of your old sins, stop them, but you've got to make the decision to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, and then you're baptized. Only after you've made the decision and are living the life of a disciple can you be baptized according to Jesus. And we understand this better now in the light of Ray Underhill's decision. Ray Underhill came to, to church, and he understood that Jesus is the Son of God. He understood he had to... Uh, be baptized, have his sins forgiven. But in the midst of all this, he was just doing it just to be a part of the church because it was that time. He was 13. I go, hey, it's about time I get baptized. But now that he's growing up and he's seen that his life has totally been in the world, he's humbled himself and says, you know something? I never repented of my sins. I never became a disciple. And then was baptized. And so yesterday, at about noontime, Ray Underhill was not rebaptized. No such thing as rebaptism. He was baptized into Christ. Amen, guys. He became a baptized disciple of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to look very carefully right here at point D on the narrow road of salvation. It says, We do not condemn the lost, they are condemned already. However, when the lost are confronted doctrinally about their condition before God, they'll either repent, run, or persecute. See, a lot of times, even Christians buy into this. Yeah, I don't like to condemn people. I, I, I just want to, you know, share my life. Hey, hey, hey. None of us condemns people. They're already condemned. We're just informing them of that condition. That's what Jesus said in John 3. He says, I haven't come to condemn you. You are condemned already. As disciples, that's the great thing. They're already condemned. Now you're bringing them the hope of salvation. Does that fire you on up or not? Now you need to understand. You start laying out the truth. They've only got a couple options here. They're either going to go, you're right. I'm not on the narrow path. I need to repent. Become a disciple and get baptized. Or, oh man, I just, I, I can't handle you. I got to, oh Wow. And you never see them again. Or they are so ticked off that you've told them they are lost. They're going to become a persecutor. Those are the only options. If you're visiting, which one of those are you going to do? There's one more doctrine that causes persecution. It's right back here at Matthew chapter 28. The Bible says that we're to baptize disciples, but look at this in verse 20. And teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always the very end of the age. You see, a lot of churches, they get their Bible out on Sunday morning, and they have a nice Bible lesson, and they inform the people about what the Bible says. But that's not what we're supposed to do. 
The Bible says, Jesus says, that we are not just to teach the commands, we're to teach obedience to the commands. That's called discipling. That's why we have discipleship partners in church. Everybody is buddied on up and has someone that they are learning from so they can become a strong Christian. And so sometimes when, when people leave the church or even before they, they become a disciple, they go, oh man, I don't, I don't want to be a part of this church. They're just so controlling. <laughs> Discipling's controlling. Well, maybe you need to be controlled. <laughs> Not because of some man or some woman. But you need to be called to obey the word of God. You know, we see it. You know, you know how we are. We see a family and we see little kids running all around. And we sometimes we don't say anything and we go, those kids are out of control. <laughs> they are out of control. And so when, when we see a physical family, we see that being out of control is a major problem. Now, I hope when we see that in our church, that you will go and one-on-one -on -one take that brother or that sister aside and help them be a better dad or mom. Amen, guys? You don't need to be gossiping about it. On the other hand, we need to understand, yeah, we can have people that are out of control that call themselves disciples because they don't want to be in relationships where they're called to obey the word of God. Amen? And so now we're, we're almost to the end right here. We have three points. Jesus was persecuted. The first century church was persecuted. There are two reasons for persecution. Life and what? And now, what are we going to do about persecution? Because the Bible says, in fact, everybody who wants to live a godly life, everybody who wants to be a disciple is going to be persecuted. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew 5, in the Beatitudes, we begin reading in verse 10. Jesus is speaking at the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Right here, Jesus is, is saying, he says, don't, don't fear persecution. Don't care what people think about you. Just be concerned about what God thinks about you. Amen? And bottom line, remember that you're not alone. Jesus was persecuted and all the prophets were persecuted. And of course, we also know our first century brothers and sisters were persecuted. Amen? Now turn over to chapter 5, verse 43 and 44. It's mismarked on the page right here. It's chapter 5. Later on in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. What do we do with people who persecute us? We love them. We pray for them. Say, so why would we love someone that hates us? Because we want them to become a disciple as well. I'll never forget, several years back, this one young mom was, was coming to church, and, and she'd bring her little kids with her. Her name was Lori. And she'd just faithfully come to church. She had those little kids. And after a period of time, she made her decision to get baptized. Now, her husband was dead set against her, but once she got baptized, her husband was enraged. There were angry words. There were curse words. There was physical abuse. And finally... Her husband, Wally, one day said, listen, Lori, you got to choose. It's either me or that church. And she calmly said, it's the church. And he just walked away. The next week, her prayers were answered when he came to church. Now, he started out in the back. You know how it is. And you you kind of start out in the back. You work your way forward spiritually. Dahim, you know what I'm talking about here, don't you? And 
And after a while, well, I got into a Bible study. And yes, Lori's prayers for a persecutor were answered. And Wally was baptized into Christ. Amen, guys? We need to pray and love those who persecute, but not compromise out of relationship. Let's go to our last scripture here in Ephesians chapter 6. This is a very key scripture in the study because as Americans, we're, we're not very spiritually inclined. And so we don't really see a spiritual world. We don't sense a spiritual world. We're very humanistic. And so this scripture is absolutely vital to drive home about our attitude towards persecution. Beginning in verse 10, Paul says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Woo! This isn't just a couple people that don't like you. These, the Bible says right here, this is all the powers of this dark world are coming after you. I don't know about you, that sends a shiver down my back even when I read this scripture right now. And that's why Paul says, you got to be strong in the Lord. You better be strong because Satan and all of his evil angels are coming after you. Jesus' mission was to seek and save the lost. Satan's mission is to seek and lose the saved. And he is harnessing all the spiritual forces of evil and focuses persecution on us to try to get us to turn back and deny the faith. Well, what's he say that we need to do then? Well, verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, you'll stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the saints. Being a Christian means that you are going into battle. Now, it's very interesting. We live in a time where the concept of being a soldier is not a popular one. And certainly we understand the horror and the satanicness of war. But we need to also understand that this war is not something that we have started. This war is Satan against God, and Satan wants to keep all the souls that are his on the face of the earth. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All are condemned outside of turning to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and being baptized for remission of sins. Amen, church? Amen. So right here, he says, if you're going to stand up against the spiritual force of evil, you need to be strong in the Lord. You need to put on the helmet of salvation. You need to have the shield of faith. You need to have the sword of the Spirit. You need to know the Word of God. You need to have that breastplate of righteousness protecting your, your chest right there. You need to have... Your feet fitted with the sandals of the gospel peace. You've got to be going places preaching the words. And in the midst of all that, you just need to pray. Pray for yourself and pray for all disciples everywhere so that everybody can take their stand for Jesus Christ. Are you with me right here? You know, in conclusion, I write this. The International Christian Churches are a controversial Christian movement. Some call us a cult and accuse us of both brainwashing and mind control. Many false rumors and half-truths have been spread. Newspaper articles, television shows, and especially the internet had slandered the ICC. And yet, the facts are that lives have been radically changed. Marriages have been healed. Drug addicts have been freed. The poor have been fed and cared for. And this rapidly growing movement, the sold-out movement, is spreading around the world in this generation just like the first century. <laughs> And you can see some good internet sites to get those people onto. You know, it doesn't make any difference 
where you preach the Word of God. Because if you open your Bible up to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, it reads the same. In fact, everyone who desires to live a godly life will be persecuted. It's true in India. Ask Rajah Rajan. He was a Hindu in his background. When he became a disciple, his father beat him. And because his father was putting him through college and had paid for all of his expensive clothes, he came into his Rajah's room and says, take those clothes off, they're mine. It's true in Mexico. A few years ago, a young lady made the decision to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, and her family, particularly her father, was super upset, and he tossed acid in her face. What's the scope of persecution? Well, for the early Christians, for Jesus, it was death. You know, when Elena and I led the Boston church in the 80s, there were several death threats. When we led the church in Cairo, Egypt, in a Muslim nation, there were several death threats. When we led the church in Moscow, Russia, there were several death threats. And when we came back to Los Angeles in the last two years, there have been death threats. This is real. You know, a few years ago, I worked as a campus minister at Harvard. And I was so excited that a young man named Li Ming was counting the cost to be a disciple. Now, Li was a PhD student from mainline communist China. As a matter of fact, he had been a member of the Communist Party. And we studied with him, and we had to go slow because he, he had no belief in Jesus. We had to start with Jesus, but he came to believe, and then we went through the studies. And it was a slow process, but he got a real faith. In the midst of this, it was fun to get to know him because even though he had been raised a very traditional way. His favorite thing in all the world to do was to watch Clint Eastwood movies. <laughs> now, I'll never forget the night before he was baptized, we count the cost. And I said, Lee, you know, there's a good chance when you go back to Red China, you're going to be persecuted. There's a good chance when you renounce being in the Communist Party, you're going to be persecuted. There's a good chance you're going to be persecuted and lose your job. There's a good chance that your family will renounce you. There's a good chance you're going to be arrested. And I've got a question for you here. As we close out this time of counting the cost. If they would put a gun to your head and say, you've got a decision you need to make now. And they said to you, Lee, renounce this church or die, what are you going to say? He says, that's easy. I just tell him, go ahead, make my day.